today's alumni speaker.
perception uh, of uh, sort of our society and our culture and race relations. But that was not always the case. Uh, that was something, uh, a part of my identity that, uh, frankly, I was a little, uh, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but self-conscious about. It was something that made me different from uh, a lot of my peers and friends and colleagues, uh, even, you know, regardless of, of, of where I was. Um, and, and, you know, that really resulted in me not ever feeling like I fit in <clears throat> in the environment that I was in, again, regardless of where I was or, or who I was around. Um, you know, I, on one hand, I'd be in places like my church in West Philly, or getting picked up from basketball practice in, in my neighborhood, um, or even just walking around the neighborhood with my dad, and something that I didn't like at the time was uh, the unwanted attention that it would bring on me. Uh, you know, people would all, often be surprised that, uh, you know, that was my dad, and i get questions like, you know, who's the strange guy picking up from basketball practice? Or, um, uh, you know, why, are you adopted, or is, is that your real dad? And, and you know, people were curious, and there was, no, there was nothing wrong with those questions, but again, it was something that made me feel self-conscious and a little bit conflicted about who I was as, as a person. Um, and so, you know, growing up uh, as a biracial kid, I, I developed a habit uh, pretty, pretty naturally and, and pretty genuinely and organically, and that's something called code switching. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the term code switching? Just raise your hand if you're familiar. Okay. Um, so while I was preparing for this speech, uh, I, I was looking for a good definition, and last night I found this um, uh, in an article from uh, a newspaper in Tampa Bay, and they define code switching as the following. For linguists, code switching describes the simple act of switching between two languages in a conversation. But in today's increasingly multicultural, multi-ethnic society, the term's deeper meaning involves shifting between different cultures as you move through life's conversations. Choosing your communication style based on the people you're dealing with. It's the reason why some black people speak with more grammatical attention when in all white settings, especially at work, but let their slang hang out among friends or mostly black people. So for me, code switching uh, uh, involved, you know, speaking differently depending on, on who I was around. And, and again, it was something that, that came natural to me. But it was also something that kept bringing that unwanted attention that made me feel so self-conscious about being somebody who was, who was a mixed, who was a, who was mixed race. Um, and, and, you know, for a while, it really did work for me. You know, as, as long as I could keep those two identities and those two environments completely separate from each other. Uh, but, you know, going to school in a school like GFS that is uh, diverse in some ways, uh, I wasn't always able to keep those two worlds completely separate. And so I find myself in certain situations, uh, you know, uh, maybe around some of my white friends speaking uh, in more sort of what you would consider black vernacular or ebonics. And, and similarly, I may be around some, some black friends speaking uh, you know, as, as I'm communicating now. And you know, that would also engender certain comments or, or questions, you know. Uh, on one hand, it would be, you know, why are you trying to act black, or you, know, you sound weird, why are you talking like that? On the other hand, you know, I get comments from other friends, you know, why, why are you talking so white? So regardless of what I did, I was literally uncomfortable in my own skin. However, um, when I was in seventh grade, uh, I had uh, uh, somebody in my life who really helped me deal with this and grapple with it. Um, and you know, seventh grade, and I know all of you know this, is, is, a, is a milestone in some, in some sense in GFS. You know, it's the first time you get a homeroom, you get to travel from class to class, uh, so you're sort of coming into your own uh, and, and becoming more mature. But for me, seventh grade, uh, I remember for a different reason. That's because of my homeroom teacher and my history teacher. See, my homeroom teacher was this young black guy, and uh, while I was so worried about fitting in, uh, it didn't seem like he was ever worried about that. In fact, he did quite the opposite. He was so unapologetically genuine to who he was, a kid who grew up in St. Louis, uh, uh, in, a, um, in, you know, in, a, in, in the inner cities of St. Louis, uh, that you know, it, it was the first time that I was really exposed to somebody who, um, who was really true to themselves, regardless of, of whether they were different from most of the other people around them. 
And that person, uh, for me, uh, was Byron Davis. Now, Byron gave a lot to his students, and I, dearly, and I know that he's, he's dearly missed by many people in this room, including me. Um, uh, but but he, he really was somebody who embraced who he was and showed me that it was possible to be yourself and, and, and not be apologetic for who you were. And just one, one story that I think uh, really exemplifies this is I remember uh, in seventh grade coming back from the seventh grade camping trip and, uh, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was a little bit of a unique circumstance because September 11th actually occurred while we were on the camping trip. Uh, so we had to come back early. So I remember uh, being on the school bus with my classmates and um, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're riding back. I don't think we fully appreciated the magnitude of the, the events at that point. Um, this is before cell phones and smartphones and you know, so we didn't have access to any visuals or, or news or anything like that, just what our, what our teachers told us. So we're having a good time, we're in a, in a, in a, in a good mood, sort of ignorant to, to what the world was going through at that time. And we're riding back on the bus and I remember we were you know, just being kids and singing, we were singing songs that we'd hear on the radio. One of the songs we started singing was uh, Gin and Juice by Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. How many of you guys know that song? You guys are kind of young. All right. Yeah, so we're singing the song, sing along with me. Rolling down the street, don't say that part. <laughs> singing on Gin and Juice, laid back. <laughs> it was like my bucket list to try to get GFS to have a Dr. Dre sit along with me. Um, so anyway, we're, we're singing that song, and it's not exactly age appropriate, it's not exactly GFS appropriate. Um, uh, and you know, Byron turned around, and you know, what you would expect the teacher to say in, in that instance was, um, you, know, you know, could you guys please maybe just lay off on the, the, the lyrics a little bit, it's not exactly appropriate, um, uh, maybe try singing a different song. Uh, but I remember this very vividly because I was sitting directly behind Byron, uh, and in, in a fashion that only Byron could do, he, he paused and he, he realized what we were singing. He obviously knew the song. Um, uh, and he turned around and he looked at us and he goes, I know y'all ain't singing about no gin and juice on my school bus. <laughs> and you know, and, and we laughed and disarmed us. Um, uh, we also shut up. Um, uh, but that was, that was who Byron was. And he was very comfortable in his own skin and again was, was a mentor for me, whether he knew it or not. In, in helping me become comfortable in my own skin. Uh, and, and it wasn't just Byron, you know, I was very fortunate while I was, while I was at GFS to have a group of diverse teachers and mentors and role models that really helped me along through that process. Chris Clemens, who was my eighth grade history teacher, Ken Aldridge, uh, my, my 11th grade biology teacher, um, Warren Evans, our jazz instructor, Herb Hamilton, is Herb here by the way? basketball coach, I consider him uh, somewhat of an older brother. Uh, and then also Yolanda Johnson, who was my 10th grade English teacher, who actually very explicitly taught our class that black English, any bonics and some, and actually the Merriam-Webster dictionary is considered a language in and of itself, so we should never feel self-conscious about using that as a way to communicate. Um, and, and I'm very appreciative for, for that experience and all those people who had that impact on my life because Without them, I don't think that I would be, be as comfortable with who I am today uh, as I've become. And um, so, so that's one thing that I think is, is, is very important, something that I'm very grateful for that I got uh, in my time at GFS. And another thing that I got from GFS and that has really led me to my career of public service is uh, uh, this, this sense of responsibility and this rich tradition of community service that, that we have at GFS. And you know, I know all of you have to do community service projects. Um, uh, you know, a lot of you may come out on Martin Luther King Day to volunteer. Uh, but for me, it was particularly special to be able to participate in those activities because I grew up in Germantown. I grew up just uh, a few blocks away from here on Haines Street off of Germantown Avenue. And um, you know, I love growing up in Germantown. It's a beautiful, diverse neighborhood uh, that has great people, great food, and incredibly rich culture and history, but uh, you know, if we're being honest, Germantown also has its challenges. And the zip code that we're all in right now, 19144, more than one out of every three people are living in poverty. The median income here
here is, uh, for a household, is $28,000 per year. Just to give you an idea of how little that is, because when I was in high school and college, I thought $28,000 was a lot of money. Um, for a middle or high school student at GFS, uh, just for one of you guys to go to school here for one year, it costs more than $30,000. So for one, one of you all to be here, it costs more than an entire family, the, the typical family in Germantown makes for an entire calendar year. Now, I don't say that to make any of us feel guilty. Um, I don't feel guilty that, that I got a chance to go here. I'm, I'm proud that I'm a part of this family and this community. But it was a, uh, as I would walk to school every day, it was a stark reminder of the opportunities that I was given that a lot of the people that, you know, my friends and family were not afforded. Uh, I have friends and family who have uh, dealt with some of the traditional challenges and issues that can come along with growing up in the poor inner city neighborhoods. Uh, issues related to incarceration, victims of gun violence, uh, victims of substance abuse, um, uh, you know, far less uh, college degrees, high school diplomas or graduate degrees, all things that, that you know, uh, those last three things that I was able to obtain. Uh, and, and it was also a reminder that part of the reason that I was able to do the things that I was able to do in life, and, and one of the reasons why I'm standing here today, is because the opportunities that I was afforded, uh, that they were not, and the challenges that they had to go through and deal with, that I did not. And so when I left GFS, I really had a clear purpose in life that I wanted to use my life and my career to give back and give so many people who weren't afforded the same opportunities that I was the same shot at success. So after leaving GFS, uh, as you heard from Dan, I went on to the University of Rochester. I was fortunate enough to play basketball there, but I also got a degree in economics and political science. Um, and then I, I went on to uh, work at uh, a job at a nonprofit for one year. Uh, after graduating one year, after I worked at that nonprofit, unfortunately, I, uh, the, the organization closed down. So 13 months out of school, I find myself um, you know, not exactly sure what I want to do, other than I know that I want to serve in some role that I can give back to the city and the community that I grew up in. Um, uh, but I'm also an employee, so I really need a paycheck. Um, <laughs> So I, I was really fortunate that uh, my boss at the time was able to connect me with the then president of the William Penn Foundation. And the William Penn Foundation, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a, a really tremendous institution. Uh, it gives away more than one, $100 million in grants to local nonprofits each year uh, to, to work on things like providing low-income kids with more educational opportunities, or protecting the environment, or, or improving parks and public spaces in, in communities that can really use them. So I, I was able to go to, to William Penn. I spent four years there. Uh, I really wanted to work on the education work because that seemed like it was something that was really core to what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, but my boss at the time, uh, Laura Sparks, was actually a, uh, a GFS parent um, and, and a mentor of mine, uh, told me that I had to go work on uh, parks and public space work, which to me it was a little odd at the time because I didn't fully appreciate the role that these spaces could play in, in communities, especially communities who are, who are more underserved. Um, uh, but that was a really educational opportunity and experience for me. What, one of the things that I learned is that I, I gained a greater appreciation for the role that a community space can play in a neighborhood. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, our, our parks and our libraries and our rec centers, uh, they're, they're the biggest providers of after school programs for kids. So where kids don't have, you know, an after school school program like we have here at GFS, they can go to their local rec center or library to get that. They can get help with their homework. Uh, for for uh, individuals who live in communities where they may not have internet access at home, they can go to the library uh, where they may you know, be able to get help finding a job, uh, get help putting together a resume, uh, help signing up for health care, all things that many of us take for granted. And so I, I worked on some, of the, on some of these projects during my time at William Penn, and, and then about a, uh, two years ago, I made the decision that uh, I, was, I was ready to, to leave and, and find something new. And not because I didn't appreciate the work that I was doing at William Penn, not because I didn't feel like I was doing important work, but it was more so that I was removed from a lot of the people that I really wanted to help. Uh, because when you work at a foundation, you are uh, oftentimes meeting with the organizations that are providing the services to people in neighborhoods. But you don't oftentimes have the opportunity to interact with those people. So I was looking for an experience that was a little more hands-on and a little more meaningful to me. 
then shortly after that, I had a conversation with my wife uh, about that. I was approached by, by somebody about this new job at the City Police Initiative called Rebuild. Uh, as Dana mentioned, Rebuild is a, a key initiative of, of Mayor Kenny's. It's a $500 million investment in parks, recreation centers, and libraries, those facilities that are really community centers for a lot of neighborhoods here in the city. And, and it's important, uh, it, it's, it's an important investment and it was a tremendous opportunity that I was interested in because we really have a tremendous asset in our parks, rec centers, and library systems here in Philadelphia. We have more libraries per capita than any other city in the country. Uh, I think we, we have more recreation centers than any other, per capita than any other city in the country. But unfortunately, uh, because the city is so poor, we have the highest poverty rate of the, of the 10 largest cities in the country. The city hasn't had the resources, they haven't had the tax revenue to keep up with the maintenance. So what you have is you have facilities that should be serving a really tremendous value to a neighborhood uh, that aren't able to do so. And I've, I've been out to see a lot of these since, since moving into my position. Uh, we have recreation centers where the roof has been leaking for literally 10 years. So uh, this one recreation center in North Philadelphia, you'll see some more, uh, when it rains, and this is in the, the gymnasium, the roof leaks and, and, you know, by the way, this is oftentimes this is the only place where kids get to go and be kids, right? It's the only place where they can go and be safe and, and play basketball or, or go to an after school program. You know, they don't, they don't have four gymnasiums like we have here at GFS. So what the coach does is when it rains, instead of saying you guys can't play basketball, he, he gets one of his players, he gives them a couple of dollars, and he says when, when they go down to the other end of the court, uh, go and take this mop and go dry it up so the game can keep going. We have libraries that can't open in the winter because the boiler doesn't work and it's too cold. Or they can't open in the summer when it's 100 degrees or more because the air conditioning doesn't work and it's literally unsafe to be in the building. We have gorgeous, huge facilities that can provide so many values and programs to, to communities that can't be used because structurally they're unsafe. It's, not, it's literally not safe to be in the building. Uh, and so while we have this tremendous system, these tremendous assets, it's really underutilized and under-resourced. And that's what Rebuild is, is working to do, is, is, is working to bring improvements to these facilities and these centers across the city. And what my job is, is I actually have a really, really cool job, is my job as the Deputy Director for Communications and Community Engagement is to one, deal with reporters, which is not my favorite part about the job, um, uh, although not beyond the fake news. Um, uh, the, but the, the, the real important work that I get to be a part of is I get to provide community members with a voice in the process of how their, their community is going to be invested in and improved. Um, so, so what I do is I often go out to community meetings uh, to let residents know about what Rebuild is, how to get involved. Uh, I will be responsible for developing opportunities for them to have conversations with nonprofits who will be helping to bring these, these improvements to their facility and make sure that whatever, whatever improvements are being made to their community facilities reflect of, of whatever they need. You know, in, in some cases, there may be a short of, shortage of after school programs uh, in, the, in the community because uh, the, the school's gym has to be closed or used for some other purpose. And so they would like to use the rec center for that, and so they need maybe a, a media lab or something like that. Maybe they have uh, a lot of kids who live in the neighborhood, so the gym is actually too small to provide all the programs that are needed. So they need a new gym or a bigger gym. Those are all questions that we need to be asking community members that as a government oftentimes we don't ask. And, and, and it's my job to make sure that we're giving them a voice. And then the other piece of my job is actually going out and, and hearing from people and having a conversation with them about how they can become part of the process and becoming more involved in their, their rec center or park or library. Uh, and, and oftentimes in these community meetings, uh, I'm able to have a good dialogue with people. Sometimes I get yelled at. Actually, most times I get yelled at. Um, uh, I just like to think that people are caring loudly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, the reason I, I talk about that, I think the reason that I'm able to, to engage in this work is really because of those lessons that I learned while I was here at GFS. So obviously, uh, while I was at GFS, I got a commitment to, to public service and, and, a, and really the sense of responsibility to give back to the city and neighborhoods that, that I grew up in. Um, but, but also what I'm able to do is I'm able to capitalize on a strength that I used to think was a weakness. I'm just as comfortable 
speaking to reporters or speaking to people in the mayor's cabinet or the mayor in city hall, as I am going out to a community meeting in North Philadelphia. I know how to communicate in different ways because I feel comfortable and I've been in different types of environments to make people feel comfortable talking to me and telling me what they think. You know, that's something that at one point in my life I was very self-conscious about. I thought I was pretending to be one thing or another. And, and through my experience at GFS and the teachers that I had here and the role models and mentors that I had, they showed me that it's something that's a strength that I should be using to help others. Um, so, so, you know, I'm wrapping up now, but I just want to leave with, with two thoughts and, and, and lessons learned. Is one, as you guys are going through your time at GFS and, and go on to do great things, one is I want you to, to make sure that you always know that you know, you can and should be making a difference in this world, whether or not you go into a career of public service or doing something else that you're passionate about. There's always opportunities to improve the lives of the people around you and the community that you're in. And secondly, <clears throat> you always need to remember that uh, you should never be ashamed of who you are. You know, my, my struggle and my challenge is being a biracial kid in, in an environment uh, like GFS. But you know, all of you are different. All of you bring unique qualities uh, uh, to your classrooms, to the conversations that you have here in school, to whatever you're doing outside of school. And those are things that you should never be ashamed of. They're things that you should uh, think of as an asset and a strength, because if we we're all the same, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be pretty boring. So um, you know, I'm, I'm tremendously grateful for the people that I had an opportunity to, to engage with and learn from here at GFS. Uh, it's, it's allowed me to pursue my career and really allowed me to become uh, the person, the man that I am, uh, and, and it's something that I'm just really grateful for. So thank you for the time. I think we have some time for, for Q&A, but uh, uh, thank you again. It's, it's really nice. Sorry, 
in terms of public service. Uh, so the question was, how did I know that I was going to commit to my commitment of public service? Um, you know, I, I think it was uh, really just a. Uh, it was a. It was a. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> you stumped me. Um, you know, I, I think it was just a sense of responsibility that I had. You know, based on my experience here, my, my experience growing up. I mean, there's nothing tying me to you know staying in a career in government. Or, or, the, or you know, working in the nonprofit sector. Um, if I woke up tomorrow and you know said I want to go work on Wall Street, I'm, I'm free to do that. But um, that's not really what motivates me. That's not really what makes me happy going into work every day. So I don't think that that would be fulfilling. So you know, I uh, I'm always free to change my mind. But I don't really know how long I'm going to do that. Mr. Myron, okay. uh, could you share with us? Any projects or facilities in Germantown that you have identified as uh, something you'll be working on? Yeah, working with or working on? That's, a, that's a good question. So, we, um, so Rebuild hasn't got started yet. Uh, we are, some of you may know that uh, the Marin City Council passed a, a tax on sweetened beverages uh, a year and a half ago, which has been somewhat controversial. That tax has been um, it's being litigated at the, with the state supreme court right now, so we can't actually get started until we know we'll, we'll have the money, which we think we will. It's just a matter of time. What we have done is we proposed to city council the first round of sites uh, that we want to invest in. There's far more sites in the city than we'll be able to get to, even though 500 million dollars is a lot. Uh, some of those sites in Germantown are uh, Happy Hollow Recreation Center over on Wayne Avenue. Um, uh, Barrett Playground, which is over in Logan. Um, nice Town Playground, which is just uh, off of Route 1 over by Wayne Junction. So there are some, some facilities over here in the area that, that, that we'll be working on. Yeah, over there. With Rebuild, yeah. Um, and so the question was how can you know, GFS kids or or Philadelphians more broadly get involved with rebuild. Um, you know, I think you know one thing that would be great is to uh, you know as we do have projects that are that are around here in Philadelphia to figure out what ways uh, uh, you know students could get involved. And every project will be different. One of the things about community engagement that we'll be doing is uh, every engagement process where we go to hear from community members what what we should be doing at the site. Should, should really depend on what the, the community is that, that's surrounding it. So, um, uh, you know, in some cases, as, as GFS kids uh, live near or sort of uh, use facilities, um, uh, there will be opportunities to get involved there. But another thing that I would really encourage all of you to, to think about and get involved, especially those of you who live in the city, is think about what ways you can get involved in, regardless of whether it's a rebuild uh, project or, or not, how you can get involved in your local recreation center uh, park or library. Um, because the city doesn't have many resources, uh, we oftentimes uh, rely on the commitment of volunteers to help keep sites clean, to uh, help bring programs there, to, to volunteer um, uh, you know, for literacy programs and things like that. So uh, to the extent that um, there are opportunities and that people have time, I think that would be a great way to, to give back and get involved. Yeah. Uh, so is the city looking to fund the program entirely from Yeah, good question. We're going to get kind of technical here. Um, so the city will be borrowing $300 million uh, and will be paying that borrowing back through the tax revenue. So we won't, be actual, we won't actually borrow that money until we know we have um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the tax revenue. We also have a $100 million grant from the William Penn Foundation. Uh, we have some money from the city's capital program. Uh, and then uh, one of my other charges at Rebuild is actually to fundraise about $50 million so we can get to that uh, $500 million threshold. Um, what is the current status of the one, one more question. Let's see what we do back. So do you think it's possible to revitalize a community like Germantown without gentrifying it? Great question. <laughs> So the, the question was, is it possible to revitalize a community 
like Germantown without gentrifying it. Um, uh, and I'm glad you asked that question. That's something that I, I think about a lot, um, especially as somebody who, who grew up here. Um, I think the answer is we, we yes. Uh, the question is how, right? Um, uh, you know, we have a lot of communities in Philadelphia uh, who are changing and receiving investment for the first time in a while. Um, and that can be a very uh, challenging process. Uh, it's a very emotional process as things change and oftentimes the residents who've been there for a very long time aren't given a say in how things are changing and oftentimes they feel like the changes aren't for their benefit. Um, so I, I think that the question is, one, as, as changes are made to neighborhoods, how do we make sure that the residents that have been there for a very long time have a seat at the table and can influence and inform uh, what types of investments are made in that community and on, a, on sort of a smaller, more micro scale, that's some of what we're trying to do with Rebuild is making sure that residents do have, have that seat at the table. Um, uh, but I think the other thing is, is we need to think really intentionally about as more money flows into neighborhoods that have historically been under-resourced and underserved, uh, how do we make sure that, that, that the people who really need the money um, and, and, and sort of can benefit financially are in a position to actually benefit from that. Um, uh, I think there are <clears throat> some programs that the city is looking at that could help with that. I think in part that requires uh, some investors that are more enlightened and benevolent. And I also think that it, it, it's uh, incumbent on the community to sort of be organized and be in a position to articulate what their priorities are and, uh, and really be vocal with their elected officials. So um, I think because a community has historically been underserved is definitely not a reason uh, it, to not invest there. I think the question is, um, uh, can we do it in a way that is truly inclusive? Because uh, if, if we don't do that, um, then, then we're really failing. We have uh, a stubbornly high poverty rate in the city, and um, uh, you know, as the city continues to grow and more investment comes in here, if we're not able to use that a tool, as a tool and a vehicle to address you know, our, our legacy issues, then um, uh, we really are, are selling all of the citizens of Philadelphia short. So thank you again.